Hey gang, this is Patrick in the rice fields of Mifune, and today we're talking about the very first issue of Weekly Shonen Sunday here on Gaijin Gai. <laughs> Welcome back to Gaijin Guy, where we talk culture, critical theory and comics, manga and monsters, film, fan studies, and folk horror. Today we're talking about the very first issue of Weekly Shonen Sunday. In Gaijin Guy's very first video, we did a quick read through of Weekly Shonen Magazine. Weekly Shonen Sunday was published the exact same day. They speeded up their schedule in order to have their magazine out at the same time. They didn't want to be left behind. So today that's what we're looking at. We're looking at Shonen Sunday. This is the very first issue. On the cover we have a Nagashima, known as Mr. Baseball. He eventually became the coach of the Giants. We have 10 yen lower than we had on Shonen Magazine and only one extra furoku, one extra freebie thrown in, but we see the topics are sports, manga, science, and TV. All the things that boys love. So uh, also on the cover we have a cut from Thrill Hakase or Dr. Thrill. Uh, this is a Tezuka comic and uh, one that is basically the star attraction of this magazine. We open it up, we have a little visual here, 21st century science, and of course now it being the 21st century, of course this is how we all go to work, the hydrojet pictured here. So yeah, still waiting for this to happen. Um, I know there are some things similar to this, but if it doesn't have this cool design, doesn't count. Uh, this is another hot baseball player from the Yomiuri Giants, Mr. O. He also eventually became the coach. So we got sports, we got baseball, we got sumo, we got ham radio, science, science people, and of course, robots. Gotta have robots and ads for erasers. But now let's take a look at Dr. Thrill. Now, from one of the reprints, uh, I was taking a look at the Kodansha Tezuka Collection reprint, and this panel has been removed and everything else moved forward, other panels rearranged. Uh, so now we're seeing it in its original form. You probably won't see this splash panel in any of the reprints. This is the very first story, The Mystery of the X-Ray Idol. And apparently Dr. Thrill is called that just because he loves mysteries and thrillers. Uh, so let's take a quick look at the visuals. Now what also uh, was stated in the back matter of that Kodansha reprint is that Shogakukan approached Tezuka about doing a series uh, in this magazine, their new magazine, but since they were aware that other weekly magazines were being planned, they asked him to promise not to do any other weekly series. Haha, -ha, that's how they get ya. In Tezuka's own words, he said, It was exciting because a weekly was something completely new. Of course, this meant I had a weekly deadline as well. I said I'd be honored. I was told they had to start advertising, so I came up with the name Dr. Thrill without knowing what the story would be. Immediately afterwards, I got the call from Kodansha asking me to do a series as well. They asked me if there was someone similar to myself who could take on the job. I immediately recommended Ishinomori Shotaro, but because he was still new, I was asked to do the layouts, which I did in secret, because he had the promise with Sunday not to do any other weekly series. So looking at here, we've got four rows of panels for this size, which is about the typical anthology comic size. Uh, for this size, you know, this number of panels works fine. 
It's when you get into the reprints that they seem kind of crowded, but for this size, it seems perfectly fine, perfectly readable. You've got uh, really dynamic, you know, of course, he's the master of the dynamic page. You have his humor. He's asking how many times has the boy pooped? And she said 24 times. And and he said, even if you're a fan of Inao, which I, I assume is a baseball player, you, you don't have to use the same number as his number. So we've got some really nice, I love these uh, so-called modern contrivance of the TV. Looks great. I love that design. And here we have blackmail letter, or it's saying basically we're going to blow up a bomb. And uh, the detective character, which we will see many times in Tezuka's works, he's interrogating people. And of course, it's April 1st, April Fool's, so they're not buying it. I just, I really love the dynamism and the exaggerated, the exaggerated movements uh, that really give the page movement, panel and page. But especially what I love about this series is I love these weird ass bad guys. You know, the one eyed, red handkerchief, black trench coat bad guys. Uh, and this kind of action is just great. You know, this is the kind of action you expect from a realistic action series, but because it's cartoony enough, you can go even more over the top. And I think that's what I enjoy about Tezuka's stuff, is anybody who can combine the humor with actual adventure, you know, like uh, E.C. Seagar on Popeye, I mean, Thimble Theater and Popeye, I mean, that guy could keep you laughing and also excited about what was going to happen next. So this is the kind of thing which I really enjoy. It's probably why I enjoy older comics more than more recent fare, because the, the pacing and uh, there's not a lot of self-reflection. It's just forward, forward. And, you know, I need some of that in my diet. I need a little bit of the pure action fun to balance out all the other heavy stuff that I read. But you just gotta love these bad guys. I just love this design with the cycloptic eye. What is it, what does it remind you of? It reminds me of uh, 20, 20th century boys, you know, Tomodachi. So there he is working against the clock. It's ticking away. But anyway, it's to be continued. Several pages on here. And to have to keep up that pace every week is probably why current comic artists have to work themselves to death. Oh. We got sports. We got airplanes. And we have fiction. Fiction, the challenge of King Satan. I just love how Satan is used in Japan, you know? It's just like any mob boss can be named Satan. Uh, you know, Satan's just your typical old bad guy, you know? Doesn't have all the uh, trappings that we in the West have given him. We have the same ad here that we had in Weekly Magazine for uh, Gekko Kamen, that live action hero that... Uh, Kuata Jiro did such a good job of converting to comics. We've got science news, sports news, etc., etc. We're going to get through to... Okay, this is art by Baba Noboru. And post-World War II, Baba started studying art, and he made, like, stage and movie posters. Uh, he also made posters for events in and around the army base in... Hachino Heshi in Aomori. He makes his Akahon debut in 1948, Kaidiki Kapporedan. Uh, and then from 1949, he was published in magazines such as 
Omoshiro book, Shogaku Ichinensei. These are monthly and uh, pretty popular books. He won the first Shogakukan Manga Award for his Putang in 1955. He eventually focused on picture books, but I just wanted to mention him because he's also important in the history of manga. Now here's a short quiz thing like we had in, in magazine. This is, the art here is by Wakatsuki Tetsu. And I couldn't find a lot on him, but it's clear from what I saw on auction sites that he did several comics for younger readers, often made educational comics about science as uh, the Furoku, the freebies. Uh, his style is reminiscent of early US animation, which had already made its way in Japan, to Japan pre-war. Though his style seems simplistic, uh, this panel from Chibi Wakamaru, a Furoku comic from the educational leaning third grader mag, shows that he wasn't averse to including some texture in his backgrounds. So, yeah, we got quizzes. What else we got? We got pages, which I'm having trouble turning. Okay, here we are. Okay, this is Yokoyama Ryuichi's Uchu Shonen Tonda. So that's Space Boy Tonder, I guess. Uh, I'm guessing the Tonda is like past tense of fly, Tonda, and then with the ER added on to make it uh, a person who flies. So we have some interesting rocket design here cartoony, very simplistic, almost like a picture book. You know, if you cut up all the pages, I mean all the panels, you could almost make a very simple picture book. Um, his comics were very popular. He was published in several magazines starting in 1928. Kitazawa Rakuten was a huge fan of his. Uh, when he started out, there were a handful of veteran illustrators that had all the sweet jobs. Yokoyama and some of his collaborators, uh, they tried to break through that barrier with more dynamic layout and lines. Uh, and he was called by some the Showa Picasso. He had many copiers, but there were none who could match him. Uh, Fukuchan, a comic he created during wartime, was used as propaganda by both sides, which is interesting. Uh, when he passed away, his daughter commented that current manga had dark and scary art and stories and that true manga, meaning fun pictures for kids, had died along with him. Alright, let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. Oh, here we go. Look at that. The Long Ranger. I didn't skip the page, did I? No, okay. So this is, was a huge surprise for me to open this up and see the Lone Ranger. It doesn't list an artist or a writer. It just has ads for the TV, like what channel it's gonna be on in different areas. Uh, the art is so-so, you know? It's almost like an early Horietaku, uh, if, if Horietaku was ever at, you know, uh, at this kind of lower level. The action uh, and the layout's not bad at all. It's just, I think there's a little bit of inconsistency in line weights and stuff that makes me feel that this guy uh, still had a couple more pages to get under his belt. Uh, so that's fascinating to me. Here's another comic based on a TV show. And it says right there, TV manga right there, TV manga. This is Namban Kotengu. Namban Kotengu. And it's by Masuko Katsumi. Masuko Katsumi. And with the name Katsumi, it's not really sure if it's a, a man or a woman, but I'm guessing it's a guy. And 
really not a big fan of this face design. Uh, this extra line seems uh, extraneous. Um, but I like this background. I like this panel very much. Uh, and I like some of the action here. And the fact that there's some kind of mystical element, that's intriguing. So, okay, so he's a double sword user. That's interesting to know. Have some action. We have some early Simpsons type faces going on there. What else we got? Fantastical creatures. So magic and mayhem. I have not heard of this show before this. Uh, I am curious. I'm curious about this guy who is, he says it's his father. So what's going on there? Okay, and then we have some, The Strange Singing Group by Yamane Hifumi. And it looks like it's a short panel, short story there. This is what I wanted to get to. Prince of the Sea. So let's talk about Fujiko Fujio a little bit. Uh, even though they were a team, they often worked on different projects, uh, lending a hand when necessary. In recent printings, you'll see one name or the other, like whoever was basically the main driving force behind that particular series. Uh, Fujiko F. Fujio, who I remember from the F, he does more kid-friendly stuff. And then you have Fujiko Fujio A, which I remember by saying adult. Like his, his stuff was more adult-oriented, a little bit darker. So that's how I kind of remember which name is which. Uh, we got some great stuff going on here besides these horrible pants. Uh, look at this bad guy. He's the dark wolf, but he's got this kind of Batman vibe, s and Batman vibe, which I'm digging. So here we start to see more of the Fujiko Fujio trademark. I'm gonna say actually Fujiko F. Fujio trademark stuff, but then disaster strikes. Oh my gosh, it's, oh, the humanity. So here comes the Prince of the Sea. So what's interesting about this one is the, that Fujiko F. worked on the good guys and Fujiko A. did the bad guys. And that's how they kind of split up the duties. Uh, this work was apparently quite popular but not as popular as a feature that came later, that comes later in this mag, which I will show you in a bit. Oh, there it is. So apparently this was much more popular. This is Sportsman Kintaro by Terada Hiro. And uh, this character, this guy, Terada Hiro, I wanna say he was quite a character. Uh, he was a policeman. He worked for NTT, which is like the ATT of Nippon, NTT, so. Uh, and after reading Inoue Kazuo's Batokun, uh, and which I believe Ryan Holmberg is coming out with a translation of soon, uh, he comes to Tokyo at 22 and becomes the first of the Tokyo group. So the, he's the first guy to move in uh, when Tezuka is there. And he kind of became like the father figure, and he was always taking care of everybody. Uh, whenever the new mangaka would come in, they'd be dirt poor, and he would take them out to dinner. Uh, he would let you know lend them the rent money, um, and these kind of episodes are recounted in uh, several comics, including Manga Michi by Fujiko Fujio. You know they feature him in their autobiographical comic. He was very close with Tanaka Teruo, whose work I recently came across. He's also an interesting character. He's behind the film series Mekura no Oichi because he created a Gekiga comic about this. Uh, basically, it's a female Zatoichi, but her personality is, is quite different. Um, so she's a, a blind swords, swordswoman slash masseuse. 
But this guy did Gekiga and Hiro Terada, he hated Gekiga. So it's bizarre that these two were good friends. So apparently the weekly comic schedule was rather hard on Terada and due to the proliferation of the Gekiga style, his style for kids kind of went out of fashion. But at this time, his stuff was super popular. Uh, this series ran a very long time and it was reprinted in several volumes. So he hated Gekiga so much that he even cornered Saito Takao one time and told him to stop drawing such stuff. Uh, he settled into like a deep depression and did less and less work and eventually became estranged and bitter. Uh, but most of his former Tokiwaso mates, they kept fond memories of him and they tried to bring him back into the fold. And he, he even kind of separated himself from his own family, which is really sad. Uh, but here we can see that his work has a simple charm to it. Panel layouts are good. He's not my favorite, but uh, you know, he was really popular at the time and important to the history of sports comics, the sports konjo, spokon comics that continue to be a strong part of Japanese comics. So I really hate to end on a bummer note talking about uh, this guy's depression. So let's look at some baseball or not. Uh, we can look at trains, that's cool. Here we have another little comic where you have to figure out the mystery. So here's the guy who's walking along reading his mag and he gets waylaid and this guy takes his place. And he says, that guy took my stuff. And he's got glasses. And so he asked the boy detective and his chimp detective, I suppose, uh, to figure out how he is the bad guy. He says, no, no, that's ridiculous. He goes, this is the part that should be surprising you. That is a gun, <laughs> which all boy detectives should have, of course. Boy detectives should always have a monkey and a gun. Uh, so I hate to, yeah, I hate to end on that crazy note but let me talk a little bit about the Sunday magazine rivalry as I mentioned in the very first guys and guy video they're both published on the same day even though they have different cover dates the cover dates are often the take off the shelf dates they were priced differently magazine at 40 yen with three extras Sunday at 30 yen with just the one extra. Sunday going for the younger reader as comics had mostly done so far. And Magazine taking a chance going for the readers that were starting to grow up with comics. Uh, so going for a little bit older reader. Sunday had the Tokiwaso group with Tezuka, Terada, Fujiko, etc. And Magazine only had Takano Yoshiteru and the one Tezuka illustration. So, you know, you can see why Sunday had done better. Uh, Sunday sold uh, about 1.5 times more than magazine. So that's our read through for today. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you. See you next time on Gaijin Gai. Gai.